And I am going to uh, share with you a PowerPoint and I'm going to do two kind of a quick um, uh, exercises for us that are designed for women. But if there are any uh, men in the audience, um, I'd like you to take the perspective of a woman as you do that exercise. So I'm going to do I have the capacity to share my screen, Lucia? Am I am I in good shape for that? OK, yes, you should be able to share your screen. Yeah. All right, fantastic. So I'm going to uh, take just one second and get my PowerPoint loaded. It's up. I just need to get it in the right place. OK, and then I'm going to share. Can you guys, whoops, All right, you guys can see my screen now, I imagine. Yeah, we can. Okay, terrific. Okay. So, I'm going to talk today, I'm going to sort of combine several things that I've been thinking about. Uh, over the years. And uh, one is, some of you may know, I've written uh, a book called The Heart of Act, which really is about how you show up in your work and the things that you're doing to bring an open, aware, and engaged presence to your clinical work. So I'm going to bring that in a bit, and then I'm going to think about um, or, or talk about uh, sustaining a flexible and process-based intervention. But I very specifically want to talk about it in the context of being a woman. So that is going to be where I spend my uh, time today. And um, I'm hoping that we'll have a little bit of time at the end for you all to ask me questions. And so one thing I'm going to do just really quickly here is I'm going to change my view just slightly. I think I'm going to change my view just slightly. Maybe not. OK, I'll just go for it from here. So let me start by introducing you. Now, for some reason, when I click forward, I can't see you guys anymore, and I'd love to be able to see you. Does anybody know what I'm doing incorrectly? Uh, Robin, what's the problem you're having? Well, so I'd like to be able to see a few of the participants as well as my PowerPoint. Is that possible? Can you put it on gallery view? For some reason, on the view part. There you are. Okay, you're back. But for some reason, yeah. whenever I click my PowerPoint, you guys disappear. So I'm going to see if I can, if I need to change this really quickly. Sorry for the interruption. We'll we'll get it. We'll get it taken care of here. I, maybe I won't be able to see you. And what you'll need to do, Lucia, is let me know. If, which is really funny to talk to a screen of, you know, a PowerPoint screen, but will you let me know if anyone has a question? Okay, I'm assuming that that's what Louis. Louis, Louis uh, oh, sorry, I, I don't know what, what, what chat I get confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. No. I'm wondering, you want to take a minute to try and see whether you can change it so to gallery view so you can see your PowerPoint and the rest of the people, but if, if anyone has any questions, I will let you know. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I do have it on gallery view. Okay, so here we go. So let me introduce you to my mom. Uh, this Robin, is, I cannot see your PowerPoint right now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're starting with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> it's a confusing day. <laughs> starting with a bang. We're really getting going here. Okay, here we go. Okay, now do you, hold on, let me, it's, um, I'm sharing. Okay, now I'm hoping that you can see my PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. And can you see this picture of my mom? 
Okay. Yes. So let me introduce you to uh, my mom, um, who has passed, but whom I love dearly. And a number of you have heard me talk about her. And um, I just can't say enough about my mom. But part of why I want to bring her into what we're talking about today and um, probably will make me a bit tearful because I miss her so much is that um, my mom didn't have uh, an easy marriage. Uh, she was married for 16 years and during that time uh, was a victim of domestic violence. And uh, so we lived in a situation that was um, quite oppressive and was about um, domination and control. When my mom uh, finally left my uh, father, I discovered this amazing human being who, although it wasn't easy, she was very adaptable and resourceful. She uh, stuck uh, with her um, ability to think of different ways to make things work and take, I think, perspective. Uh, she was truly flexible, even though she was supporting four children on her own and uh, trying to do the best she absolutely could. Uh, she's a role model for me and uh, her persistence and um, ability to change given the new situations that we encountered is inspiring. And so some of what I'm sharing with you today is not just a story of act, but it's a story of legacy. It's a story of the women who have um, come before us and uh, have paved the way uh, in terms of gaining equality, uh, gaining an, uh, an equitable uh, future, although we still have a long way to go and a lot of work to do. So I'm going to tell you a story about a woman who I'm unsure if you know her. Uh, Catherine Schweitzer is her name. And she is the first woman to enter the US's Boston Marathon, which is a pretty famous marathon. It's typically a known worldwide. I hope you know about it. Uh, she did that in 1967. And the only reason she got in was by a clerical mistake. Uh, women were not allowed to run in the Boston Marathon, but because of the way um, they entered some piece of data into the spreadsheet they were working on, uh, she was allowed to enter. At the time, it was thought that if women ran marathons, that their uteruses would drop out of their bodies, that they didn't have the physical constitution to engage in such a thing. And that was 1967, which is um, after I was born, right? So it's just not that long ago. And what happened when they discovered that she was in the race is they tried to get her out. And here you can see a photograph of the man behind her left, uh, her right shoulder, trying to pull her out of the race, trying to drag her off the, off the track. And the guy to her uh, left is her, uh, or what would be a, the guy with the shorts on, uh, is her boyfriend who managed to uh, pull the guy off of her. And then the men surrounding her came around her and protected her and allowed her to complete the race. And she finished it in four hours and 16 minutes. After that, she was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame, and she started what was called the 261 Club. And if you can see on her chest is the number 261. 
After uh, women were then allowed uh, in the early 70s to run in the Boston Marathon. And she would attend every single one. And when they would finish the race, they would collapse into her arms and cry because they were allowed to participate and do this very meaningful thing. And it's women like her that um, create something different for women like us. And when you think about the, the thinking and what's happening as women are trying to move into equity, there's a lot preventing it and a lot of misunderstandings about women. I will say too, that if we think about equity more broadly, the women, women's suffrage movement in the United States began in the 1800s, the mid 1800s, 1848. We were finally allowed to vote. But let me tell you something about that. The thinking of the time was that if women uh, uh, women couldn't vote because they didn't have the mental capacity to vote. And that if they spent time thinking like that, what it would take to vote, that it would drain their ability to be engaged in reproductive processes. So if women thought it would drain their capacity to give birth to babies. So they wanted to keep women out of that process saying that it was too much. And so as women began to fight against these ideas, they were labeled insane. And uh, some of them were put away in um, homes for the insane, where they were electrocuted, and they were um, shot with water that was coming like out of a fire hose onto their bodies. Uh, they were uh, force fed and given treatments that today would be considered unethical to try and cure their insanity for wanting to vote. We know that the Argentine women achieved the right for suffrage, the right to vote in 1947, almost 100 years after women in the United States were allowed to vote. And it breaks my heart to know that. And I have wondered as I was creating this PowerPoint, what the women in 1947 went through in order to make that happen for those in Argentina. Um, just a couple of other pieces of information to contextualize our history a bit. Uh, in the late 1800s, uh, many health professionals of the time uh, used interventions on women, uh, primarily female, that but today would be considered unethical. Uh, women were considered uh, uh, fragile and more emotional. Things like hysteria were used to diagnose women, and it was considered a disease. And as I mentioned, the treatments were uh, sometimes pretty horrific. Sexual interventions, uh, lobotomies, taking part of their brains out, uh, hydrotherapy, I mentioned that, high pressure hoses and electroshock therapy as a way to try to tame women because they had emotions or were considered fragile. Well, and let me just say that women still struggle today and the struggles are somewhat different, but we still struggle. And part of our struggle is inside of our own system of psychology. So the initial versions of the Diagnostic and Statistics Statistical Manual is one of the key manuals that we use around the world to diagnose people was created by men only. So it was developed, designed, initiated by men only. And 
remnants of the early understanding of women's bodies continue to even influence some of the things that we think about today, like um, PMS or premenstrual syndrome uh, is sort of nested inside uh, DSM in many ways and has been voted on and talked about as if your hormones indicate some kind of disorder. Um, it's uh, one of the things that I worry about and I'm going to make a case for is that um, maybe DSM is not uh, the most useful thing uh, for women and diagnosing women period may not be the most useful way to approach uh, women's mental health issues. So especially given that contextually the, the whole series of diagnoses were developed by men and by the time women were allowed to participate in the DSM or diagnosing process, the train was already on the track. The way that it was set up was already a medically based male oriented process. Women came into a process that already existed. And so I wonder what makes a woman mentally healthy? Like, how are we going to define that? And I want to take a closer look at this because these diagnoses are built on what goes on inside your skin. And we forget to look at our own levels of environmental stress and other life circumstances before we jump to conclusions that are based on our internal experiences. And this picture shows an example of what I'm talking about in terms of all the different roles that we play today as women. And so let's take a closer look at this issue in particular. So um, I want to engage us here today in understanding what's happening outside of our skin, what's happening in our environment that maybe is where the issue lies for a majority of struggles that women face, not what's inside. And so I want to move beyond something being wrong and disordered. Maybe what's happening for us in terms of mental health isn't about the way we feel on the inside. And let me build this context out for you even more as we think about inside versus outside. So just a few facts about women's education. Around the world, this is worldwide, girls face barriers to education that boys do not face. There's 100 and million, 130 million girls are not attending primary or secondary school globally, 130 million. But we know that for every extra year a girl stays in school, her income can increase by 11%. So essentially by not educating gir young girls, we're preventing them from moving forward in their ability to contribute to their own lives. Um, <clears throat> this is why I appreciate uh, Malala. I don't mind if I have to sit on the floor at school. I just want to get an education. Uh, women spend at least 2.5 times more than men on unpaid care, domestic work, cooking, cleaning, fetching water and firewood and caring for children and the sick and the elderly. That's a significant amount of work that women are doing and it is essential to life. It makes other types of work possible, yet it remains largely invisible as a contribution to society. The global uh, gender gap in terms of pay is really astounding to me. It stands at about 24%. Women are making a quarter uh, less than men on average. And globally, uh, less than 20% of women are landholders. 
And when they do have land, it's a lower quality. Uh, so it doesn't produce as much as uh, other as men's land does. And it's kind of sad in the sense that women represent between 43 and 70% of the workforce in agriculture. So they're working somebody else's land. Women in leadership is also uh, lagging incredibly far behind. They're just 22% of all the par parliamentarians around the world um, have women. And fewer than 25 of the world's 196 countries have a woman leader. We're underrepresented as voters. We're un underrepresented as leaders nationally, regionally, and even locally. Even at your community level, your very community level, your voices are not heard. And all you got to do is take a look at this picture of uh, this is a British uh, a picture of a British uh, parliament. And you can get a good sense of who's leading that country and what they look like. There was a task force created by the American Psychological Association. Uh, and what they found was that women and girls are more likely than men and boys to be objectified and sexualized in the media. Uh, portrayals of uh, women uh, uh, are, the, are the thing that set up the ideals for young girls to reach toward. It feeds us the notion of our concepts and identities. And women uh, uh, are three times more likely than men to be dressed in a sexually provocative manner. And you can I, I love this image. Can you spot the difference when you look at the front of this GQ magazine? How women are represented versus how the men are represented. It's stark when you look at the distinction between the two. Uh, women are objectified in the media all the time. And these are the kinds of images that are used to sell products all around the world. And can you imagine the message that it gives our young girls, our teenagers? Here's some more of the types of images that objectify women or sexualize women. And if you look to the top right, uh, like here is a very intimate moment and what you see is a man looking at his girlfriend as if she were a car. And you can sort of get a sense of the kind of uh, messages that are out there and all around the world about women. And if you look to the uh, lower left, you can get an idea about it as well. Further contextualization in terms of violence against women. It is a global problem. It occurs in every country in the world. It crosses all groups and classes and it will affect one in three women in their lifetime. If we look around this room of women that are here, a third of them have experienced rape and violence against them. A third of the women here have experienced those things. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's higher, given that we've all gone into the field of psychology and are looking for answers. Uh, women's health and well being in this modern age remains challenging. And if you all recall the Women's March on Washington here in the United States, which actually turned into a worldwide event, women all over the world marched on that day. It was a testimony to how we're still facing the indignities, the disrespect, the inequalities of our own health and well-being around the world. This is continuing around the world. So it leaves me with this question and a question that I pose for us here is, has history 
and the notion of what creates mental disorders and well-being in combination with our social pressures of today and what it means to be happy and successful and what it means to be a woman has that set us up to reflect on our own mental health struggles, our own sense of identity, our own lack of power is something that's caused almost nearly entirely by what's going on inside our skin. Low self-worth, low self-esteem. Like if you're not successful, we don't look to all those things that are going on that have moved us in this way in history that are outside of the skin. We go like this and the, our system turns it on the woman as well and says, it's your insides that are broken, not the history that you've come from and the environment that you experience. And I find that to be a bit of a tragedy. Um, women's voices and their voices around their own health and well being have been undervalued for ages. And yet we're at a really high risk for social injustice and mental health struggles. So not only are we at risk because we have all of these factors happening around us in the world, we also don't get to talk about it in the way that men get to talk about how we are, if that makes sense. This is just a few mental health stats to kind of paint this picture, like depressive disorders account for close to half of disability uh, compared to 30% um, of men, we're two times more likely than men to experience post-traumatic stress disorder. And we know that post-traumatic stress disorder tends to occur more frequently because of interpersonal violence, like sexual trauma and domestic violence. Men are more likely to die from suicide. Their rate is much higher because they use more lethal means but women attempt suicide two to three times more often than men do. And if you look at the eating disorders field, and this is no surprise given the messages that we're giving about what we should look like and some of those images I shared with you, we're the large majority of eating disorders. Women struggling with this particular thing. And we wanna say that it's the woman that has the problem and I want to say, maybe it's not the woman that has the problem. She is a symptom of a larger problem. So our, our traditional standards, as you all know, being members of ACBS and participating in this conference, that, um, that happiness is upheld as the standard for mental health. But I want to add in here something for us in particular. It's happiness and being a good girl being a compliant and good girl, that is a marker of well-being. So I'm making the argument that context matters and maybe a more useful way of understanding uh, power and mental health issues for women is in something that's broader and contextually driven and it's about the dynamic moving interaction of people their learning histories and their environments it's not necessarily something that's going on inside their skin and <clears throat> cultural issues are also important all around the world the levels of sexism and oppression what are the kinds of unfair treatment that occurs across countries that stunt things like growth, development, and well being? Uh, how does abuse and intimate partner violence play a role? There's many countries still in our world today where it is not a crime and it's perfectly fine to beat your partner. It's perfectly fine. And there's an adverse portrayal of us in the media which I um, have already spoken to. Ultimately, what I'm saying is that context matters. So uh, why are we interested in this as humans? Why would we wanna look at this in a different way 
or take us to another place? Well, let's ask and answer that question. Robin? Yes. Can I pause you for a moment? Yeah. Sorry, continue. I'm sorry. Okay, great. No worries. So, um, what will be added if we empower women and if we empower women through our psychotherapy and the work that we do? And if we help women be more adaptable and psychologically flexible and we look at what's going on outside and not just what's going on inside? Well, will improve the global GDP, like we'll add as much as $28 trillion to the global gross product, the annual product by 2025. There'll be more resources for our children because we know that when women have more control over family resources and spending patterns that it benefits children, uh, gains in women's education and health have been shown to result in better outcomes for kids. And when their outcomes are enhanced, the growth prospects and the contributions to their countries grow. When women are allowed to plan their families, their quality of life improves and the quality of their children's lives improve. When women are allowed to have some say over when they will um, have children, they, they are better parents, basically. Uh, companies managed by women are report more motivated workers and higher productivity than those managed by men. That might be kind of bad news for men, and I apologize for that, but that seems to be the case based on the studies. Women tend to be more affirming and check in with their employees more often, which increases motivation and interest and productivity and countries that educate women have far better economies healthier citizens and less violence than those places that don't educate their women uh, and here's something that's near and dear to my heart and you can see this unfolding as a problem today a uh, gender equality strengthens democracies um, democracies are about bringing all people in and excluding half of humanity from equal participation weakens any democracy because it's not a democracy in that case, right? Um, it's more, uh, when we have women participating, it's more reflective of the collective interests rather than the interests of just one section of uh, the human uh, race. And again, countries that display lower levels of gender equality are more likely to be involved in civil war and conflict. The violence is more severe uh, than countries that have uh, hold women to a higher status. So here's what we need. And it's a big task. We need improved legal systems, institutions and services, improved reproductive health and choice for women, safety for women, improve mental health for women. We need improved recognition and equal pay and participation in the decisions that influence us. And of course, the area that we're most interested in and the area where we're making our impact is in the area of improved mental health for women. So what I'd like to do is just take a moment and um, do just a kind of brief uh, exercise with you. So I'm going to invite you to everyone to take a breath and just gently close your eyes. And take a, another deep breath. Just settle in and I want you to reflect on this and answer it. 
finish the sentence. When I see what's happening to women around the world, what breaks my heart is. When I see what's happening to women around the world, what breaks my heart is. Lo que veo lo, cuando le está, lo que le está pasando a las mujeres alrededor del mundo, lo que me rompe el corazón es. Y ahora la invitación es a expandir la perspectiva y dar la respuesta a esta pregunta, a esta afirmación. Cuando veo lo que le está pasando a esta sociedad, a nuestra sociedad, como resultado de lo que les pasa a las mujeres, yo siento, me pregunto, y terminando esta oración, cada una, cada una, cuando veo lo que le está pasando a esta sociedad, como resultado, And then lastly, when I think of young women and their future, it looks like. And here you can add anything you like. What do you think when you think of young women and their future? What do you hope for them? What do you fear for them? I'll invite you just to kind of hold on to that, how you've answered those questions. And in a little bit, we're going to come back to this space. So our work in the CBS community, let's turn to that. And just gently open your eyes again and rejoin, just holding on to what you, what you uh, said to yourself there. What I'm wondering is like, what are the unique contributions that we, the contextual behavioral science community, and those learning and conducting acceptance and commitment therapy, what are the contributions we might be able to make? One thing we can do is we can certainly work together for equity and health, both broadly worldwide as an international community and within our own community. Uh, we can really stand behind the value of choice and coming into the kinds of things that you'd like to be responsible for in terms of your own values with respect to women. And I think we can use the six core processes to create change. We can lean into open, aware, and engaged in a way that changes things for women locally, for you, for your clients, and maybe even, if I can dream big, the world. And part of what I want to invite you to reflect on here is, what is our collective responsibility as women who are serving as mental health providers? What do we as a collective want to create for other women, knowing what we know about where they stand in the world? And can we grow that collective responsibility to include men that they too might be interested in raising women to equity? And whatever that responsibility is, will we take it? Will we? engage it and bring it to life in some way. And that's a question only you can answer. So power and good mental health aren't about interventions linked to being free from low worth and a self-esteem. These are not the problem. These are not why we need to help the women around us. 
power and good mental health are about moving toward and sustaining a flexible and process-based intervention in the context of being a woman, where we let go of things like you need to have a better self-esteem and we move into things like values-based action, connecting to living and engaging in an ongoing way that's adaptive and creates for us and our children a different space to be in as we move forward. And this is where I think the heart of ACT lies in you bringing forward into your clinical service, into your personal life, the values that you care about in this arena. Um, as I mentioned earlier in in writing the heart of act it's a personal journey that we uh, get better skilled when we do the work with ourselves and then we transmit it and share it with our clients and the people who we come into contact with and so our work here is about bringing um, our values and our work and its heart into the psychotherapy room. And um, part of our work here is to be aware, fully aware of how we feel about these things, how we care about these things. We need to um, step into and support our own sense of a fulfilling life. What is a fulfilling life for us? And, and how can we be aware of the inequities and do things that are linked to personal values? And I recognize that it requires courage. Sometimes stepping forward um, is really painful. It's not easy. And sometimes stepping forward feels a bit lonely uh, because not everyone will agree. And there will be forces that will um, try to keep that inequity in place. So whatever uh, uh, you are doing for you and you are doing for your clients, recognizing that joy and pain will be a part of it is I think part of this process as well. It is vitality, it is vital though, right? It has a lot of vitality in it. Joy and pain uh, bring uh, vitality. And we uh, need to make lots of room for women to grow their meaning in life and what's important to them, to institute their own sense of vitality, and maybe even revisualizing power and well being. And instead of holding out the um, uh, uh, medical models, you're broken on the inside of your skin, we can revisualize it as a system that needs help and we can do part of that. We can work right inside of that using psychological flexibility as a fundamental aspect of empowerment. Because when you think about your own values and living them in an ongoing way, uh, there's an empowerment behind it. But what I'm inviting us to do is to look at it in terms of our interventions with women and how we talk to them about what's going on for them. That we need to grow our uh, context in terms of um, their experience. Because we know this from the CBS experience, right? We know this as members of, of ACBS, that all humans experience a full range of thoughts, all humans experience a full range of emotions, a full range of sensations. And um, what it means to be fundamentally human isn't about uh, being less than. It's about stepping into and experiencing life. And you will hear me say this again and again, again and again. We are whole and experiencing beings right here, right now, where we start whole and experiencing beings. Our problem is that a long time ago, we made pain a problem, internal pain a problem, 
and the way our logic works is problems are made to be solved. And part of what happened in that journey is that we got in our heads and got way up here about how things should be and we bought into the messages that have come our way. And when we did that, we lost our hearts. Not just us, I'm talking broadly as human beings. And we made it a problem for women Instead of seeing a response to what is happening in their context, we made it about what's going on inside their skin. So I want to bring us back to being human and recognizing that being flexible in this moment and fully consciously experiencing all that is there to be experienced inside your skin there's nothing wrong with it no matter what message comes in from the outside and that we step forward with our values in an ongoing process of behavior change it's about movement and adaptation courage strength stepping forward and we know that if we can increase the women that we work with flexibility like if we move away from rigidity around rules about how women should behave rules about what's okay for women to experience uh, a societal dictates about um, women's abilities if we can like move away from that rigidity then a lot of dynamic processes can begin to unflow, I mean, unfold and flow over our lifetimes. We can step back and diffuse from that which we've been told about how we should be. We can begin to adapt to situational demands. We can shift our mindsets and behavioral repertoires. We can get, begin to get balance in our life, which many of us probably don't have. We can connect deeply held values and shift perspectives, seeing the impact on the world, on our kids, on men and ourselves. And so I suppose what I'm arguing here, I'm arguing for here, is to really let go of that feel good agenda. And I'm going to say it more broadly, that be good girl agenda. And give it over to living well. So rather than focusing on that internal content that we've bombarded with, been bombarded with, um, that uh, we look at this approach incorporating the transaction between women and their environment, recognizing how much agency do they have in this context? Um, are their values been pushed away by some notion of how they should live and how they should be? We want to consider uh, the uh, flexible application of emotional expression. And what I mean by that is that you're not hysterical because you feel. And I'm pretty sure you're not going to lose your uterus if you go for a marathon run. Pretty sure about that. Let's open up to joy and pain and anger. Like, can we be angry as women? Let's, I want to say yes, let's get out there and let people know we don't have to act on it in ways that are damaging, but we can say enough and we could bring it to the context as it's warranted. And we can focus on the ability to modulate our behavior in the real world instead of suppressing it based on what we've been told we should do. So it's a process. And uh, I want to invite all of us to think about the, um, uh, the four processes around the hexaflex in a very specific way. Like, um, as we engage in this endeavor, should you choose to do so, that these six core processes are not static things. They should be labeled, in my opinion, accepting, not acceptance. Diffusing, 
a wearing perspective taking that there's going to be discomfort and perhaps even extreme discomfort that might come with confronting some of the issues that face women and the challenges that they have. And we'll need to diffuse about our from our stories about it's all about your own self esteem and your self confidence and your self worth. Being aware of where we are and what our needs are what our emotions tell us and share with us and then taking perspective of the women that we work with and inviting those around us and men to take that perspective as well. And so in your work. I think there's going to be some pretty important things and that's helping the client to connect to an ongoing awareness of their experiential state and you doing that also what is my experiential state in my world and in the work that I do with my clients. Am I responsive to my state and their state in supporting them in what's needed, given their context, rather than given some kind of message on the inside and can we look at the an awareness to the various social and cultural constraints that women experience and what are the historical constraints that women experience and feed them into our understanding of what's happening for the person sitting in front of us and then ultimately a focus on inviting uh, women to um, step into values based behavior. And as members of humanity um, allow us to interact more harmoniously and more uh, equitably giving space for all rather than space for some or 50% of the population. And when we're in that space, it makes it easier to reach goals that might be impossible to reach at the sort of self focused individual level. One of the things I appreciate about women is their level of cooperation and their ability to come together and make a difference. And in some sense, it'll be necessary, and this is assumption, to have shared values that guide us in our work. Um, otherwise, uh, we won't function as a community or survive as a community. Doesn't mean we can't disagree doesn't mean we might intervene in different ways, but to um, really fundamentally recognize what it is that we want for women and what we want for ourselves. And then engaging in ongoing action. Like when I think about the six core processes and how they can help women and the mental health issues that they struggle with, ongoing action is um, like I want to bring my mom in here. She never gave up. One foot after the other, after the other, after the other. And recognizing that choice plays a role in power and good mental health isn't about being free of our internal experiences. It's about being fulfilled. It's about love and play. It's about learning and growing. And it's about freedom and the ability to exercise choice in your life. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I want to help my clients reach. And you, if I have any impact on you, that is where, where I'd want to go, is that you are free and can exercise choice in your life. And ultimately, life is about joy and pain. So there's no place here where we get to do this without some amount of suffering. Just like Catherine Schweitzer, who was nearly dragged out of the marathon. And we're in a marathon. We're not in a in a in a 100 yard dash. We're in a marathon. So I'm going to invite you again to just close your eyes. And take in a deep breath. And as you think about some of the things you thought earlier about how women stand in society today and the concerns that you have for them, 
I now invite you to think about some of the things that you love about being a woman. What do you love about being a woman or being a member of a larger group of women? And just let yourself rest inside of that for a moment. And notice how it might feed a value or values that you have. Let yourself just breathe into that experience. And ask if there's ways that you can pull that forward into the work that you do in your clinical work the women that you see in your practices. And then I'll invite you to take a deep breath. And when you blow out, just gently rejoin the room. I wanna read a quote by uh, Maya Angelou. Each time a woman stands up for herself without knowing it possibly, without claiming it, she stands up for all women. Thank you, Maya. And ultimately, I want to um, mention compassion because uh, I think it's so important and so relevant to how we will choose forward, move to move forward given the history that we come from. Um, it will be needed in almost everything we do. And if we can guide women to have compassion for themselves, for you, uh, and if you can guide the women that you work with to have compassion for themselves, that they can begin to see themselves as whole rather than damaged or corrupted by the messages about them or about their inherent being because they have hormones or something like that, then we can really begin to build something loving, something worth fighting for, standing for. And it'll be a life from the feet up process, not head down. You know, the way this unfolds and the way this works is you bring this into the work that you're doing. Yeah as a no arrival deal that you're on your way and you keep going and one foot after another life from the feet up not the head down bring your heart along and then finally what i would say is it is about love and hope um, my mom had hope for me as a young girl and one of the things that she said to me uh, when I was quite young is, you can be anything. You can go anywhere. You can choose. One of the most important messages of hope for my own future. And if I can spread that message, that message, then I'll be happy to do it. And that is the end of what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you very much for listening. And I will come back to uh, Lucia and see if, um, are, is there time for questions? I'm not sure. We have time for questions. The same time you had originally is no problem. So <laughs> thank you very much, Robin. That was amazing. Yeah, you're, it was it was my pleasure. Um, you're welcome, and I would be happy to answer any questions that folks might. And have. you really surprised me with this context about women that was very relevant. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, it's. Um, I think we forget the context that we come from sometimes. Yeah. I, 
because we get caught up in the focus of diagnosing and what's going on inside and we lose um, actually all the places and messages and things that have happened that have come before. Thank you. I'm seeing some of the uh, the messages that are coming in and just they're so beautiful. Thank you so much. I love you too, Manuela. And uh, wow, that's really great. Just I'm I'm really moved by what you're saying. I feel I feel a little bit tearful in this moment. Thank you. Um, if I don't, maybe there are no questions at this point. Uh, hopefully, if you have any, you would could feel free to contact me and um, or pass them along through uh, Lucia or other organizers, and I'd be happy uh, to answer those. I don't want to bail too soon if there's a question. Let me just check, Lucia. I, I didn't hear you, sorry. I don't know what channel you're on. <laughs> I'm also here, Robin, if, if it's needed to translate something. Ah, Manuela, wonderful. So I see one question. I have one question and related to what you were saying. In now when I'm seeing young women that have their image distorted, that they can't love their image, their body image, and the context in which we are, that it's really painful about how we should look and how our body has to look and how we need to be seen. I want to ask, how do you intervene in this kind of situation? Can, how can we help them? Because it's a very painful situation for this young woman. No, it does sound incredibly painful and very hard because, I mean, I gave you like a 0.001% of the kinds of messages that young girls receive today about how they should look and what their bodies should be like. And it's a very rejecting message of the body. And so I think one, I would probably do something compassionate that has to do with noticing that her having these kinds of messages is not her fault to really see that she's not to blame for the struggle that she's having that these messages came from outside in she wasn't born as a baby thinking i have a terrible body right like that stuff came in as she grew and learned and so she's not to blame for having these thoughts that are on board and I'd have her notice that it probably was never her intention to struggle with these things either. Right? If you take her back to when she was younger and first started to think about her own body, even though she's young now, but younger, she probably wasn't thinking, gosh, I sure hope I grow up and struggle with the way I look. None of us here would want that, right? Like, none of us are to blame for our own personal struggle for our appearance and for um none of us would have wanted us to struggle with this as we age and you know now women have not only do they have to struggle with what they look like when they're young they have to struggle with what they look like when they're old too right like wrinkles aren't okay older women are disposable right like the messages just keep coming and so 
I would work with her compassionately. She's not to blame and she didn't intend for this. These were things that came, not things that ha things that happened to her, not things that she did. And then I would work with her to diffuse as much as possible, but from that very compassionate place. And I'd have her take perspective on the messages, see if she can see them, see if she can notice where they're coming from and that they didn't emerge from inside so she can change her relationship with a little bit. So those are those are like um, three different things that I would try to assist her and then work from there. I hope that's helpful and answers the, the question or at least partially answers it. Por supuesto que sí, muchísimas gracias. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for all that you have shared with us. My, my pleasure. I saw a couple of questions, Manuela, in the chat box. Um, should I tackle those too? Are we, going, are we out of time? I don't know, but I can start reading some of them. How could I work with women that have affective dependency with their aggressors? I think this is a very tough uh, thing to work on because part of what happens is you'll hear, I know that he hurts me, but I love him, right? I love him and I want him to be a part of my life. And so um, sometimes you have to get in and work on values, like what is your value about how you'll be treated? What is the value of if they have children of the message that you're giving to the children and just be curious about it with them because you can't force them to make a change and see if at any point there may be their partner is willing to get help and to have the courage to say, I don't want to be harmed anymore by you. I don't want to be hurt anymore by you. This is not okay. But that's a really tough place, right? And um, women are afraid to leave. Women are, feel dependent. And you know, if you don't have money and you and you also depend on that person, like the situation gets even harder, right? Like the contextual variables are even more challenging. And so, safety, as much safety as possible, I would build in. Like, what are all the ways? she's going to stay that she can be safe and um, uh, have compassion for herself. There's a question in English and one in Spanish. If you want to read the English one or I can translate the Spanish one. Okay, let me do this um, from Liliana. Uh, this was beautiful. Thank you, Liliana. Um, how do you help women who are fused with their story because they are fused with cultural messages? I think, again, we got to do a lot of perspective, perspective taking in that same piece. Notice that you weren't born with those messages. And how have you become attached to them in a way that's potentially harmful to you, that doesn't fit with what you care about and value. So um, sort of going back in time, like doing space and time work about, you know, when you're young, you don't have these things. And as you get older, they come on board. And so let's take some perspective on that. And if you could rewrite this story, how would you rewrite it? What messages would you want to be given? We can expand what it is that they're hearing about themselves. And then, of course, a mindfulness to diffuse, uh, see, see the ongoing process of thinking rather than buying into it and acting on it. Do you want to do the one in Spanish? Yes. How do we do around the messages or phrases that put um, a road for women 
and for example disempower the work of feminists and uh, women that fight uh, for feminism. I don't totally understand the question. I have to say in, even in Spanish. <laughs> well, let me see if I can take a stab at it. So one of the things that has happened across time, and some of you may have um, recognized this, that feminism has become a bad word. And that is not surprising to me at all, because it's another way to sort of, you know, put the brakes on women's equity. And so part of the um, work I think that we have to do is declare, I'm gonna stand inside of something that's important to me. And even if you disparage it, I will stay. I will take this extreme discomfort and stay so that I can be on this path that I think is important. And there's lots of different ways to do work to promote women. There's like tons of ways. So you don't have to be out pro protesting in the street necessarily. You can be writing letters and you can be supporting women in your clinical work. Like there's lots of ways to do it. And so finding the way that works for you and the path that works for your clients, I think is the, is the way to go. Uh, Manuela, I think I'll just take one more question that was in e English from Flavia, because I think perfect. It's perfect. My question is, what about men? Do you think the message will be the same for them? It's a it's a great way to um, end this question uh, or in the in this um, um, uh, presentation, because we got to get men in here and working with us, or it'll never work. Right? And this is not about hating men at all. It's about loving women and, and, and holding women to be as valuable as men instead of devalued as compared to men. So it's not about hatred. And we want to be clear about that. And so part of the work here is helping men to see what it's like to be devalued and to grow compassion for that experience. That too can happen in all kinds of ways. And of course, we got to find men who are receptive to it. And the, and the men that have joined this, this uh, presentation, thank you for being here, right? And you've got work to do. I'll be quite honest about it. And uh, we need to, um, communicate in ways they're invitational, but we might also have to be angry at times. Uh, and we might need to be willing to experience extreme discomfort ourselves and invite them to do the same when they're looking at how they're keeping themselves in power. Um, <clears throat> so I hope that answers at least partially that question of Lavia. And I think with that, I hope I, I will just say thank you all so much. Again, I hope this has been um, a useful, at least thought provoking presentation uh, for all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care everybody. and. Uh, have fun with the rest of your conference, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. It was a real pleasure, Robin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucia. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you, my dear. Always loving work.